And this is a very special day for us, and you'll see what I mean in just a moment. My Father, thank you so very much for this day, and we thank you for the church. We thank you that you have created this miraculous body of believers. Lord, that it's uh, throughout our entire world, and we have a local expression of it right here. And we're just so blessed to be able to be part of this local assembly. We do want to pray you'll continue to bless and enrich everyone who's part of it. And we just pray you'll continue to uh, help us uh, to be uh, filled with the, with the Spirit of God. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to begin today by wishing you all happy birthday. Happy birthday. We celebrate the birth of Christmas, December 25th. Now, that may or may not be accurate. I don't really know, but we celebrate it then. But 50 days after the resurrection is a little more accurate. For tomorrow, I believe, is actually the 50th day and is the day of Pentecost. And it was on this day that the birth of the Lord Church actually begins. So, happy birthday, church, right? Happy birthday. Now, the Greek word for Pentecost means the 50th day. In the Old Testament, the Feast of Weeks, or Feast of Harvest, fell on the 50th day after Passover, which is our resurrection day, or what we call Easter. Fifty days after our wonderful Lord rose from the grave, the Jews celebrated Pentecost, also called the Day of First Fruits, Numbers 28, 26. So let me just read that for you. This will be an opportunity for us to actually study this great, great uh, feast and what it means to us. Also on the day of the first fruit, when you bring a new grain offering to the Lord at your Feast of Weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. Now the amazing event of Pentecost in AD 30-ish saw the first fruits of a spiritual harvest as 3,000 souls in repentant faith, trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And because they were saved, they were baptized and were added to the Lord's church. So let's read of this marvelous, marvelous event. Acts 2, and I have a number of scriptures that actually involve 1 through 21, and then 32, 33, 36, 30 through 41. So I have a lot of scripture for you, so bear with me. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing for us to actually experience and to understand and know. So here we are in Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had finally come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language? In which we were the Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Pergia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, from Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues and the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying one to another. Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, 
they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up in the, in the eleventh, raised the, his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above this and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful event this is. But I have more for you. I want to go on in Acts 2. Then Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, let's pay attention first to verse 39 of what we just read. On the day of Pentecost, Peter declared... For this promise is to you, who's the you? Jews. This is Jews. And to your children, the Jews' descendants, and to all who are afar off, that's us. And as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, here's the first thing to pay attention Pentecost is about a fulfilled promise. This is a fulfilled promise. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The New Testament says Jesus received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 33, and then he poured out the Spirit at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit, who is God, started a new work at Pentecost in his relationship with believers. John tells us what would actually happen. Matthew 3 and Acts. Matthew 3, 11 says this. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Acts 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Pentecost was this baptism. Pentecost was this baptism. The baptism in the Spirit of God. John had described the Holy Spirit being like wind. 
The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit, John 3. It is the Holy Spirit that gives spiritual life. It's called regeneration or born again. He makes us spiritually alive in Jesus Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, there's absolutely no spiritual life whatsoever. I don't care how what you appear, what your religion is, there is no spiritual life. Romans 8, 9 spells it out clear. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. John 6, 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. The Holy Spirit is spiritual life. It is also the Holy Spirit who actually gathers us into the Lord's church. A couple more verses here. Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming often is mightier than I, and I, will, uh, I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then 1 Corinthians 12.13. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit who actually gathers us and puts us into the church. It's not being in a denomination. It is not taking a catechism, getting confirmed, or being voted on, or any such thing. It's being baptized with the Spirit upon receiving Jesus Christ. And that is what Pentecost is all about, and that's why it's so important for us. The Holy Spirit comes rushing wind. There is no mistaking the fact that something special is taking place. The Spirit of God filled the whole, the whole house, immersing them in his presence. They were completely surrounded by him. Like when one is actually immersed in water. Or like, it's like being dyed, taking a cloth and putting it in dye. You are immersed in the presence of the being of God totally. And then he changes your color. And I have, n it's no reference to skin pigment. You are now made pure. You are made holy. You are made totally clean. The Holy Spirit is now indwelling us as believers. Tongues of fire rest on each one of them. They began to speak in other languages. Those that are from different nations hear them speak in his own language about the mighty deeds of God. These were Jews, devout men, who had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem from many lands for the feast of weeks. That's what they're all there for. The feast of weeks. In verses 9 through 11, we have a list of nationalities and places that they come from. And the beautiful thing is that all those who receive the Lord in Jerusalem at Pentecost can now take the good news of salvation in Christ back to their own countries where they have come from. Thus, the gospel gets kind of a jump start. It's a jump start toward its eventual spread to all nations as Jesus had commanded in Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
But these people who were baptized in the Spirit at Jerusalem are all Jews. These are Jews. Acts 1.8 talks about taking the gospel to everyone. Jews in their homeland, Jews in their scattered lands, Jews wherever they may be, and then Samaritans and even Gentiles. The body of Christ, which is called the church, is made up of everyone who receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who are then baptized in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in us, in you, which has a profound effect on our lives. And all we have to do is take a look at someone like Peter. And obviously, a spirit-filled Peter is very, very different than the one who cringed before a little girl who denied his Lord three times. What made a difference in this man that we just read about in Acts 2? People observing what was taking place accused the disciples of being drunk. Often alcohol does embolden an individual to speak what's on their mind, often in a foolish, out-of-control, slobbery kind of way. But Peter refutes this absurd accusation, saying it was only the third hour of the day or 9 a.m., 9 in the morning. And even those who are drunkards are not inebriated that early in the day. That was especially going to be true on a festival day such as Pentecost. This was holy. This was special. What transpired on this day of Pentecost was not a drunken aberration, some strange behavior from the norm. No, as already mentioned, what took place was a fulfilled promise, a fulfilled promise to the Jew. Peter connects what took place to what was spoken through the Jewish prophet Joel. Let me read Joel and connect it to Acts. Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And now we turn to Acts. And it came to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservants and on my maidservants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts 2, 17, it starts by identifying a time. The last days. Notice that? The last days. And this was a common Old Testament expression that referred to the time when Messiah would come and set up his kingdom. No one knew that there would be two comings of the Messiah separated by a long period of time. This was not clearly understood in the Old Testament. However, it's there. Not directly, indirectly, but it's there. In the Old Testament, it teaches that the Messiah would come as a suffering servant to actually die for the sins of the world. Read Isaiah 53. On the other hand, it also teaches that Messiah would come in glory and set up his kingdom. Isaiah 9, 6. And the first coming of Christ ushers in the last days. The last days have thus lasted nearly 2,000 years. And during this time, God has graciously called... 
Jews and Gentiles to salvation and actually chastened Israel for their unbelief. That's why it's so long. What does this have to do with the prophecy of Joel? I'm so glad you asked. The complete fulfillment of Joel's prophecy awaits the coming of the millennial kingdom, Christ's second coming. On the day of Pentecost, Act 2, it indeed, it indeed throughout the church age was going to be playing a part in this whole process. But God had given both a preview and a sample of the power of the Spirit and what will actually be released in the kingdom age. So believers in the present church age have a foretaste of kingdom life with the Holy Spirit. In the millennial kingdom, when Christ comes back to rule and reign, God will pour forth his spirit upon all mankind. Did you catch that? All mankind. Why all mankind? Because only the saved enter into the millennial kingdom. All mankind, only the saved entered into the millennial kingdom. All lost will be removed. It's the reverse of the rapture. During the church age, God pours his spirit into only believers. Only believers. Thus, only believers who have the Holy Spirit enter Christ's church. And that's what the, usually the elders of a church or people who are interested in joining a local assembly, what's the requirement? You must be saved in the church. And now we recognize that. We recognize, yes, this is a believer. Your profession of the Lord is true. And you are welcomed into the fellowship of believers. Only believers have the Holy Spirit enter into Christ's church. In the kingdom, there will be perfect peace. Isaiah 9, 7. Peace rules now in the church age, only in the heart of believers. In the kingdom, Jesus will reign he reigns now in the hearts of those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the kingdom, Christ will judge all men. He's the judge. Now, in the church age, he judges his people through the church Matthew 16, 17, and through the Spirit's convicting ministry in their lives, John 16, 8. Let me just read those. Matthew 18, 16, 17. But if he will, but if he, but if he will not hear, take with one of you two more, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him, do, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Then John 16, 8 says this, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's the Holy Spirit. We will ultimately come to full fruition of the kingdom but it began to be seen at the birth of the church at Pentecost. However, not all the components of Joel's prophecy are actually prefigured in the church age. It's not until the Spirit is poured out upon us all mankind, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see 
uh, shall see vision, and your old men shall actually dream dreams. The nature of the prophecy, dreams and visions, that will take place during the millennial kingdom remains a mystery. We know that prophecy had begun to be exercised in the early church, or else we would not have the New Testament. We believe prophecy continues today by proclaiming God's completed word. No additional revelation has come to the church throughout this age. That might change in the millennial kingdom. I don't know. I really don't know. In any case, it will be the Spirit of God who actually does this. And this is what Peter is pointing out to his listeners in Acts chapter 2. This is the promised Spirit. What they were observing was not the effects of alcohol, but the effects of the Holy Spirit. And this is something the Jews had never seen before, even though it had been predicted in their holy book. Joel's prophecy involved a great work of the Spirit of God, and that is what they were witnessing, even though the total prophecy was not being fulfilled until Christ's second coming, when his foot actually touches the Mount of Olives. There was no blood, fire, or vapor of smoke. The sun was not turned into darkness, nor the moon into blood at Pentecost. These are all events that accompany the second coming of Christ. They are connected with his return. Let me take a look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24 says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What a day that will be! Yet, the Spirit had to 120 believers in the upper room fulfilling the promise to baptize them. The millennial promise, Holy Spirit, was now before them. Everything now depended upon what they were going to do with you-know-who, Jesus Christ. Everything was now dependent upon what they were going to do with our Savior. The climax of Peter's quote from Joel was, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2 38. And that every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, he's, he's exposing them. He's providing for them. There it is on the threshold. Receive Jesus, and you'll receive all that has been promised of the Spirit of God. The Jewish nation as a whole, had rejected Jesus as a, blasphemer, as a blasphemer and actually ended up executing him. Now, Peter calls on them to turn their backs on all that unbelief and embrace Jesus as their Messiah. That was repentant faith. Peter also calls on them to prove the genuineness of your repentance by submitting to public water baptism in the name of Jesus. 
In much the same way, our Lord called upon the rich young ruler to prove the genuineness of his repentance by parting with his wealth. Now, giving away one's possession is not necessary for salvation any more than getting water baptized is. Salvation is not a matter of either water or economics. However, true repentance inevitably will involve submission to the Lord's will. And the Lord's will is that believers are baptized in water as a testimony to their union to Jesus Christ. Christ as Lord and Savior needs to be professed. The forgiveness that sinners need and the Lord gives is linked to repentant faith, not water baptism. Pentecost and repentant faith is for forgiveness. Water baptism follows that forgiveness. It is the public sign or symbol of what has taken place on the inside. It is an important step of obedience for all believers and should clearly follow conversion. Forgiveness of sin is the blessed joy and privilege of every believer upon receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by simply trusting him and what he has done for us, dying as our substitute. But salvation does not only bring forgiveness, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And like salvation, the Holy Spirit is free and unmerited. The Spirit does not come through water baptism. He comes as a gift with repentant faith in Jesus Christ. He comes to anyone at any moment they receive Jesus. The Holy Spirit was not merely for the Jews in Peter's audience that day of Pentecost. Salvation was to be, was to be for all. But for any further millennial promises that would come to the Jew, they must accept Jesus as Messiah, which is something on the whole the nation of Israel has yet to do. Let me read you Romans chapter 11. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Israel has a great future. But when Israel actually receives Jesus as the Messiah. It's only at that point, after the tribulation, that the millennial promises will be ushered in, and until then, they remain blind to Christ. The Holy Spirit now goes to Gentiles to work through a new entity, the church made up of Jew and Samaritan and Gentiles. For it is these different groups of people who are baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts to form God's church and to show the Jew that it is Jesus who must be believed in before they can actually receive the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit and their millennial promises. We read with me Romans 11, 7 through 14. Follow along. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. 
just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy. Salvation has come to Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. What would actually provoke the Jews to jealousy? Paul wants them saved. The Spirit wants them saved. Jesus wants them saved. But they won't believe. What provokes the Jews to jealousy? It's when the Holy Spirit brings believers to Christ and not Judaism. It's when the Holy Spirit goes to the Gentiles and not the Jews. It's when the Gentiles receive God's blessings and the Jews receive God's judgment. Let me turn to two sections of scriptures and we will close. The first one is in Acts 8, 14 through 17. And these are important, important connections here. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them that only been baptized in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, the Jews would never, ever believe that the Holy Spirit of promise would come to a mixed breed of people who worship God on Mount Gerizim and not Jerusalem. The Samaritans were not only not liked by the Jews, they were hated by the Jews. But God loved the, the Samaritans. And he would save the Samaritans, whoever would receive Jesus Christ. And we see Samaritans receiving Jesus as Savior, being baptized in water, but not receiving the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God was going to show the Jewish Peter and the Jewish John that the Spirit would come upon Jews as well as Samaritans. And thus, when Peter and John lay their hands on them, they received the gift of the Spirit. It was so that the Jews could see, the Jews could identify that, you mean, this promise that was going to the Jews is now going to the Samaritans? Absolutely. And the same thing happens in Acts chapter 10. Let me read this section. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who has ordained by God to be judge over the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, who's the circumcision? The Jews. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. They're shocked it goes to the Samaritans. And now they're astonished 
that it goes to the Gentiles. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, and Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? The Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles in the same way as it fell on the Jews on the day of Pentecost. That convinced Peter and the other Jewish believers with him that the same Spirit had come to both. This was a giant step for these Jews to admit that God was coming to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Thus, all recognized that Gentiles should also be water baptized. Water baptism followed salvation. Peter's entire argument for baptizing Cornelius and the others rested on the fact that they had received the Holy Spirit upon believing Jesus and therefore were saved. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Water baptism thus played no part in their salvation. Because of spirit baptism, the Jews, like the Jews, they were now going to uh, publicly confess in symbolic fashion their inner transformation of salvation and identify themselves through water baptism. Thus, from that day to the present, that very day to now, when a person comes to Christ believing and receiving him as their Lord and Savior, trusting in his finished work on the cross and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes into that believer, providing them eternal life, baptizing them into the body of Christ, what we call the church, and they are saved. Once saved, a public confession is then to be made. They are to be baptized in water. Because Israel rejected Jesus, they lost out on the gift of the Holy Spirit and the millennial promises for now. That will change when they receive Jesus at the end of the trib. But we now, we who know Jesus, form the church. We have not lost out on the Holy Spirit of God, and we should live in his power and by his word. Human might is no substitution for the Holy Spirit. The church should not be marketed. It should not be market-driven. It should not be purpose-driven. It should be Holy Spirit-driven. Then we have what God provided for us. All the self-help programs in the world cannot match the beautiful and powerful work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of repentant, baptized believers. The Holy Spirit is provided and given and is in us to transform us into the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18. 3, but we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are strengthened on the inner life, in the inner man, Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. We are shed abroad with God's love, how? Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not dissipate because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. 
It produces a lovely cluster of a ninefold fruit. Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. He assists us in our understanding of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. He aids us in our prayer life. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he grants assurance of our right relationship with God himself in 1 John 4, 13. But this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Make sure the power of the Holy Spirit is yours today. It came on Pentecost. It formed the church. It's for you. You have received the greatest birthday present that has ever been given anyone, the gift of the Holy Spirit, God in you. Happy birthday. Amen. Let's pray. Well, my Father, you are so kind, you are so gracious, you are so merciful. You have provided us a power we can never have in and of ourselves. We are your church. You have provided us the Spirit of God, and we can only now just say, thank you, thank you, thank you for the Spirit of God. Through Jesus we pray, amen.